How's it going, guys? Just before we start this episode today, I'm not going to take up much of your time because I know you want to get straight over to the episode, but just want to say thank you so much for being here, for listening in and watching this episode. Whatever your platform you're on, it makes a massive difference that you're here, and I know you're going to come away from it with something really good and useful. Just want to say quickly, though, that over the last few years doing this podcast and building it up, we have really gone from zero to 100 in just the guest range, the editing, every element of it has just increased and all of it has really been down to the incredible subscriber base who have hit that subscribe button and supported me on this journey and I'm going to ask you please if you could do the same today just hitting that subscribe button or that follow button whatever platform you're on makes a massive difference to the journey that I'm on with this podcast and truly every every subscriber contributes to getting a bigger and a better and a more famous guest on the show and it just makes everything possible so guys if you could please just do me the favor of hitting that subscribe button or a share or leaving a rating and a review it makes a massive difference to this journey i'm on so guys thank you and without further ado let's get over to the episode How's it going, guys? Welcome to episode 107 of Talk 4, the Quickfire podcast, where we ask four great questions to unique and interesting people. Behind the mic today is your host, Louis Scoopian. And let me just introduce our incredible guest for today, Tim Parlatori, who's going to be answering a few questions today. Tim, how are you doing today, man? And uh, welcome to the show. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm... Uh... I have to say, I mentioned it to you at the start of the, uh, you know, before we jumped on here, super, super stoked to, to have you on and an industry I haven't touched on yet. So really keen to ask a few great questions here today. And before we jump into those questions in kind of a 30 to 60 second ish sort of format, elevator pitch style, just quickly who you are what your day job is and it's a little intro and kind of snapshot into your day-to-day job if that's okay sure uh tim parlatore i'm the managing partner of uh, parlatore law group uh i had about 15 attorneys that work for me it's a cloud-based law firm so built from the ground up with uh all remote uh and my personal specialty is criminal defense and civil litigation uh, yeah, I never really specialized in any one particular kind of case. I just specialize in high stakes litigation, you know, cases that are weird, uh, cases that are unique and uh, and difficult. And so, you know, wherever there's a big fight in a courtroom, that's that's where I like to be. Uh, yeah, I mean, looking at some of those past clients that you've had, really, really top of the food chain in, t- in terms of big cases. So I feel like I'm talking to a, a, a proper legend from this space, but I always like to kind of, take a look into the backstory of people first before we go into the current job so um before you know I feel like we'd be reminded not to talk a little bit about the Navy career and get an idea of kind of like where you came from and how you got into the industry you're in now so I understand you're a Navy guy can you kind of walk us through that part of your life a bit quickly and what you did there and just kind of take us through to like the start of your legal career how did it all come about for you Sure. You know, and it's kind of a, you know, it is a full circle uh, for me. Everything did build on one another. So, you know, I started off my career in the Navy. Uh, I went to the U.S. Naval Academy undergrad, graduated class of 2002. Um, 9-11 happened when we were seniors. And so we were the first class since Vietnam to graduate during a time of war. Uh, 21 days after graduation, I got on a guided missile cruiser and went straight over to the war zone. Uh, I did two deployments on USS Normandy as a surface warfare officer. And, you know, first deployment we were doing primarily, um, you know, air control and uh, strikes into Afghanistan and also, um, you know, oil embargo enforcement in the uh, Persian Gulf is pre-Iraq war. Uh, Second deployment, we did a lot of um, counter piracy operations off of the coast of Somalia. Uh, And I left partway through that deployment uh, to come back because my time in the Navy was up. And so I went back and showed up at law school um, and started at Brooklyn Law. And so that was really the transition. Uh, It was kind of a a quick uh, transition. I showed up in law school. I sat down in the auditorium and, you know, the dean is welcoming us to law school and saying, you know, the Law school is very different from college. This is this is not like what you're used to. 
this next year will be the most stressful experience of your lives. And I just sat there and I looked around the room and I realized every single kid in this auditorium actually believed what she said, <laughs> but I did not. And, you know, and it wasn't, it, it wasn't, you know, compared to deployments and everything, it wasn't. Um, yeah, you know, I did my time in law school. Um, I worked pretty much full time uh, for a for a lawyer for a criminal defense attorney Eddie Hayes while I was there, um, and you know got into a lot of great cases. You know there and really learned you know on the streets how the criminal justice system works. Uh, went from there to uh, to another job working for a solo practitioner, um, and you know got to work with a lot of these real legends of the criminal defense bar in New York City. You know, I got to I got to spend time and learn how to practice law from all of the greats who tried the John Gotti trials, for example. You know, all the great mob trials back in the 80s. Uh, you know, these were my mentors. And so, you know, Ron Fischetti, Bruce Cutler, um, Eddie Hayes, Jeff, Jeff Hoffman, uh, George San Angelo, all of these you know, men are the ones that really taught me how to practice. Uh, so I eventually went out on my own, uh, for my own practice. Um, I did that for a few years. I, I partnered actually with Bruce Cutler for a couple of years. He was John Gotti's main attorney, uh, and then went back out on my own and then eventually, uh, joined a bigger firm, um, and kind of took my skills that I'd learned doing a lot of this, you know, organized crime and, you know, all form of, you know, various, you know, criminal activity and took it to a bigger firm. I did that for about three years to get into more white collar stuff uh, before leaving that to, to start my own. Interesting. Um, what was the what was the spark for you then in that industry that kind of got you to at least piqued your interest in going in that direction? Because, you know, from the people who I've spoken to in the military and the guys who've got out the military seems like the kind of at least like the flow that they tend to go down initially coming out of the military tends to be the private sector and defense and security and consulting. So what was the kind of the motion there? And what was the, what was the motivation for you going in, into the law stuff? Has that always been something that's really been interesting to you? Uh, yeah. Talk me through that. So when I was at the Academy, um, my goal was to spend an entire career in the Navy or, or really the Marine Corps was what I was thinking about at the time. I was I spent the first two years there really focusing on trying to become a Marine Corps infantry officer. Uh, and two things happened to really change my my perspective on that. Uh, one was, you know, the summer before senior year, uh, we, we spent the summer down in Quantico, Virginia, um, doing training with the Marine Corps. Um, you know, assaulting villages, doing all this, uh, you know, great training. And I learned that as a Marine infantry officer, I would be mediocre. You know, I, I wasn't going to be the best. I, I could do the job. I think I could do it well, but I was not going to be the best at it. Um, and this, of course, still pre 9-11. Um, and so that happened. And then pretty much simultaneous to that, my best friend got in trouble. Um, Dan, he, it, it was a practical joke that had gotten totally out of control and it had, you know, gone from something that really should have been just a silly little joke to where he was facing being separated from the Naval Academy and his Naval career being done Wow! before it even started. Um, and so he came to me and he said, you know, Tim, what can I do? Uh, and so we just sat there and I was very good at regulations. And so we just sat there, went through the regulations and figured out why it didn't fit into what he was charged with, but why it did fit into something of a much lower severity. And I said, okay, so this is what you need to say. You, you need to say, I didn't do this, but I did do this. And he looks at me, he says, that's great. I have no idea what you just said. Um, can you come with me? So we went up and to meet with the, um, with the commandant's uh, staff judge advocate, uh, which is a military lawyer. And we walk in and, he he's looking at us like you know what the hell are these two kids doing and dan says you know sir i wanted to speak to you about my case um present something for the admiral to consider and he says okay well what's he here for he's like well i don't know how to explain it so i need him to explain it for me so so i did 
And, and I sat down with this lieutenant commander and I laid the whole thing out and he looked at it and he said, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to go talk to the Admiral. He does. The Admiral agrees. They knock it down to a lower level discipline. He goes to the battalion officer. He pleads guilty. He has to you know, march in a square for like 100 hours carrying a rifle, uh, but he doesn't get separated. And today he is about to take command of the USS Zumwalt which is wow. one of the most advanced warships in the entire U.S. Navy. Wow. So that experience made me realize I'm really good at this, and I really enjoy this, and I can make a difference with this. You know, I just saved my best friend's career. Or I could go be a mediocre infantry officer. So that's that's kind of where I, I made the shift and I said, okay, I want to be a military lawyer. And so I, I tried to figure out, because it's not something you can do straight out of the academy, and I figured out if I go on a ship as a surface warfare officer, that's kind of the fastest path towards lateral transferring, you know, going to law school and becoming a, a JAG or Judge Advocate General officer in the Navy. And so that's the path that I chose. And, and I and I did the first several steps of that right up to the point of actually getting selected when I was not selected. So I then, you know, I had an opportunity to get out and go to law school on my own. So I said, okay, I'll go out, go to law school on my own and apply to come back in. And I applied several times to come back in as a JAG officer. And I was rejected several times to come back in as a JAG officer. And so that's, that was kind of, yeah, as I was doing that and, you know, working in New York City and, you know, really learning more about, you know, the New York City criminal defense world, as the Navy was rejecting me, this other world was, you know, was calling to me. And so that's when I started getting into that. And and honestly, in, in retrospect, became a far better trial lawyer as a result. Mm, really, really interesting story. And I can totally... I can totally see how that motivation would push you to going down that that route. And before before we dig into the kind of the other stuff, the law stuff, I think something that I heard on on the SRS show that you spoke about kind of at least gave me a little bit of clarity into your industry. And I'd like to just go into this just quickly before we go into the questions. We live in a very judgmental world where people will kind of judge anyone just because of any sort of like an affiliation with a name that they dislike and obviously you've represented former president trump and many prolific figures you know you did work in the eddie gallagher case i wanted to just get you just to quickly kind of talk us through what the ethics are behind the work that you do and how do you kind of manage the preference personal bias and kind of personal emotions towards the clients that you have and if you personally have like any association with a particular party, because what you said on the SRS show it really gave me an insight into how you separate personal life from professional work. So how do you manage all that? And can you just talk our guests through that too? So we can get an idea of how it works for you. Sure. And you got to, you got to remember, this goes back to what I was just saying about the people that were my mentors, um, John Gotti's lawyers. Okay. They were not gangsters. You know, people tried to paint them that way, but they were not gangsters. They were lawyers. As lawyers, we have an ethical obligation to protect the rights of our clients, period. And that doesn't matter whether the client is somebody we like, somebody we hate, somebody we agree with, somebody we disagree with. And so it is that ethical obligation um, that is really at the forefront. And so do I agree with all my clients? No. Do I like all my clients? I like a lot of my clients. It's one of the beauties of private defense is that I can reject clients that I don't like. But you know, ultimately, my job is to make sure that their rights are protected and make sure that the government is doing its job and following the rules. And so, you know, this was something back back when I was doing more of the you know, organized crime type work. You know, people would ask me, well, how could you defend, you know, bad people? And well, you know, it's not just about, you know, defending, you know, so-called bad people. 
It's about ensuring that the Constitution is followed, okay? Because there are constitutional rights that every single one of us has. And when the government is out there doing what they do, if they don't respect those rights and if they're not held accountable for their violations, just because you may not like this defendant, what does that mean for the future? If you say, okay, you know what? We don't like you know, John Gotti or Donald Trump or whoever, so go ahead and violate the Constitution there. Well, you've not given them a license to do that to everybody. You've given them a license to do it to you. And so, yeah, I, I'm going to talk about one particular case here where I represented a guy who I really did not like. Uh, he was charged with, uh, with drug dealing, um, and I got him a good deal. And I, I told him, you, you know, you, have, you really should take this deal. And he says, no, I don't want to take it. I, I don't think they have it. I want to go through discovery. Sure enough, they give me discovery. And I look at it and I see that they screwed up on the warrant. And as I'm sitting there reading it, I'm saying, it's a really good motion to suppress based on the misconduct in this warrant. But if I win that, a guy that I don't like, who really did do what he is alleged to have done, is going to walk free. And I thought about it, because I thought, I don't need to make this motion. Then I stopped myself. And I said, this has all of a sudden become the most important motion that I've ever written in my life. Because the moment that I make a decision not to defend the client's constitutional rights because I don't like them is the moment that I need to quit and find a new line of work. Because when lawyers pick and choose whose rights are worth defending, the system fails. So ultimately the judge uh, had less compunction than I did about throwing him in jail anyway. <laughs> but um, but that, that kind of really guides you know, how I operate. And so I do love taking on cases that have you know, significant political ramifications. Uh, yes, a lot of my clients have been on you know, the right side of the aisle. Um, do I sit on the right side of the aisle? Not necessarily. Uh, I will tell you this. I do not agree with either political party. And so, you know, therefore, I don't take a position on that kind of stuff. You know, when it comes to, you know, for example, representing President Trump, and, and I still do a lot of TV interviews where people ask me about the case, and I'm very clear that I'm the lawyer. I have nothing to do with the campaign. My job is to talk about whether he should go to jail. Whether he should go to the Oval Office is somebody else's topic to talk about, not mine. And so therefore, I am comfortable. I've represented people on both sides of the political aisle, and I'm very comfortable with that. If Hunter Biden or you know Bob Menendez called me tomorrow, I would happily talk to them as well. So I mean that and that's that's the philosophy that I put down through my firm. And you know, my firm is very diverse. We have people on all sides of the political spectrum. We have people that have, you know, voted for Hillary, voted for Biden, voted for Trump, you know, all across the board. In fact, a lot of my people, I don't even know who they voted for. Because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. What matters is do they fight each case based on the facts, evidence, and law solely? This is a dangerous job, personally, to you. Something I've I've thought about kind of even just a few minutes before the podcast is obviously these are the ethics that you abide by and this is what makes you a great lawyer, but people aren't always that don't always appreciate that, especially if it's with someone that they dislike or if it's got personal attachments, like for example, a victim's family. Have you ever found that this job has got dangerous for you on a personal level by representing someone or taking a case? Have I received death threats? Certainly. Plenty of times. Um, every time I go on MSNBC, I get several emails from their uh, 
from their viewers talking about how I should lose my license and be killed. Oh, God. Um, God. Do I take any of those seriously? No. You know, I think that, you know, they're one of the <clears throat> drawbacks of, you know, social media and the connectedness of the world is now that everybody you know, feels like they have a voice. And so you have a lot of you know, what I call keyboard commandos who are perfectly consent content to sit there in their apartment and, you know, type a message. Uh, <laughs> yeah, to me, but, day. <laughs> you know, are they going to actually walk up to me on the street? No, they're not. Um you know, I, yeah, I will say, say this, you know, you asked me about my political affiliations. Um, yeah, you know, I am a supporter of the Second Amendment. Um, so, you know, that is, you know, one position that I take that I, you know, that I certainly exercise for the purpose of if one of those people does decide to come out from behind the keyboard. But um, no, I haven't really had a problem. With it. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's something that but but it's also something that I I try to maintain at all times, you know, the air of reasonableness. And you know, that's why even when talking about Donald Trump, yeah, you know, I go on MSNBC, I go on CNN, I go on CNN probably more than anywhere else, I go on Fox News, I go on these different networks on all sides of the spectrum, and I'm not sitting there talking about you know, it's a witch hunt or election interference or all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about the case. And so, you know, that that has, you know, I think served me quite well in separating me from some of the, some people who have, you know, gotten a lot more into, um, you know, blurring the lines between legal and campaign. Mm, yeah, great points. Very well put. Um, So on the show... I try to, well, I mean, I'm aware that I have what's clearly a very diverse range of audience members from the people who message in, the people who talk about it. And really the concept of the show is kind of four questions for unique and interesting people and getting everyone who kind of tunes in here to come away with something. So if we kind of take a dive to start with into the shallow end of the work that you do, um, sure. just so everyone's on the, sh on the same page of this, you've worked with very prolific people and powerful people can you give us maybe a bit of insight into what comes with the job then so how do you come to choose or reject cases and clients and kind of what are like the career risks that you face by taking on a case and maybe just kind of give us like a little bit of the brief sort of flow chart in in um in how you approach a case and regardless of the client so yeah just a bit of info into what it takes to be you Sure. So the biggest thing for me when uh, when selecting a client is do they have a legitimate case? Um, you know, there are a lot of lawyers out there that um, you know they they will take on any case or you know take on cases for people because they like them, and then they'll do things based on what the client wants as opposed to what makes sense and what they know as a lawyer. Uh, some will do things. In fact, I just had a conversation about this earlier today with one of my attorneys uh, that I was mentoring on something that there's a big difference between what we can do as lawyers and what we should do as lawyers. And so when I'm evaluating a case, I'm looking obviously at the facts and I'm looking at the law and I'm saying what can be done. Can I actually help this person? You know, and I've I've rejected plenty of cases because the answer being, look, you know, obviously I'm in this business to make money, but I don't want to do it unfairly. And for you to pay me to do this case that I know right up front, we're going to lose. I am not going to be able to get you what you need. And it's one of the reasons why at intake level, one of the first questions that I ask clients always after you know hearing their story is, what does victory look like for you? And because I want to understand what their expectations and their hopes are. And if that's something that I think is realistic, then, then it's something that I'm interested in. Uh, now, realistic doesn't necessarily mean it is um, You know, certainly when I'm doing criminal cases, um, you know, they all have the same, 
sense of victory. Victory looks like being found not guilty. <laughs> uh, and, you know, certainly, you know, for example, Eddie Gallagher, that was a very, very difficult task. So I don't shy away from it because it's difficult. I shy away from it if I think it's impossible. You know, and that's that that's the thing that really um you know speaks to me. Also, you know, there's an element of I want to I want to be careful how I say this. Mm -hmm. Depending on the case, I want to believe in it. Yeah, you know, I want to have I want to have some sense that there is a good um a good defense here and so um and that means a whole bunch of different things it doesn't necessarily mean it certainly doesn't mean come in and try and convince me that you're innocent okay because that that's not, not what it means at all it means is there a legitimate defense that's worthwhile um and so if you come in you say look i you know i'm a child molester and i want you to try and you know get me off on this that's not something I, I i i enjoy that's not something i would take off so um i also like things to be interesting you know I, there are lawyers out there that do a volume practice where they do a lot of cases that are all the same you know like they do nothing but dwi defense i did a little bit of that early in my career it's boring you know they're all the same mm -hmm. So, um, yes, yeah, so I like something that's intellectually stimulating. Yeah, so it's a very, it's a very interesting subject, and I think one of the really kind of one of the real subjects I wanted to to ask a question about here is um, something I want to dig into is when I hear about something that's happening over in the states politically or here or anywhere, where do I go? Where do I hear about this? I hear about it in the news. Right. Yeah. I go to Wall Street Journal <laughs> or I, you know, take a flick over to Twitter and see what people are saying, not to believe it, but to see what they're saying. And right. you are someone who has to sift through what you actually said in your own words, not personally, but as, you know, corporation, you have to sift through millions of documents. Ultimately, you see the facts and you structure defense based upon facts, records and proof. What do I need to know and what do our listeners need to know about what the news says and social media versus what the truth actually is, especially in cases that involve powerful people? So what are you seeing on paper in front of you on your desk versus what's being notified from Apple News or something on your phone? Like, how does that look? How is that different? Everything you're reading is written by somebody that has an agenda. Okay, that, that's the most important piece here. And when I read, yeah, I, I, I tend not to read any articles about cases that I'm doing when I'm in the middle of trial um, because it's it's a waste of my time. It's just going to aggravate me. Um, but, you know, sometimes it happens. And uh, usually because people throw an article at me and say, hey, Tim, look at this. Look how, look how wrong they got it, <laughs> you know. But... It's amazing to me when you're in court and fighting and then the articles that come out later that night about whatever allegedly happened in that courtroom, depending on the publication, depending on their personal agenda, you'll hear something totally different from what actually happened. And it's not that they, it's not that they're fabricating. It's that they are choosing the parts that they find worthwhile to support their conclusion, and they ignore the parts that are not. Um, so, yeah, you know, for example, I when during the Eddie Gallagher case, one of the witnesses came in and on direct he told this you know very coherent, well rehearsed story, and on cross examination he totally fell apart, completely fell apart. Couldn't remember even the basics. And all the newspaper articles talked about his answers to the prosecutor's questions, and they omitted everything that he said in, in response to my questions. Only one publication published an accurate account. 
And the next day, you know, I, I walked out of the courthouse after and they have all the bank of microphones set up and they, you know, they want me to answer questions and they're all shouting questions. I said, all right, before I start, I read all your articles about yesterday's day of trial. Not something I normally do, but somebody threw them at me and I, I, I read them. It took a couple of minutes. I'm going to take the first question from you because you're the only person that actually accurately reported what happened yesterday. They were all upset at me for saying that on TV. He was upset at me for calling him out as being the only honest journalist there. <laughs> I upset everybody in one, in one you know, move. But so what I do, is, you know, on my phone, if, if I show you the, you know, the news apps, I keep a vast array of news apps. And if I want to know what happened, I will read both sides of it. And if you read, for example, you know, if, if there's some speech uh, that was given and you read the CNN article about it and the Fox News article about it, between the two of them, you're going to get something resembling the truth. Or you skip that, go on YouTube and see if you can find the source material. Mm. So the news media in general, um, yeah, there's agendas to it. So, so, so you have to be very careful with, with reading any of that stuff. And, yeah, and it's something that I deal with a lot with, you know, when I'm called on a case because... You know, this this happens all the time where something will happen on the news and my wife will look at me and she'll say that guy's going to call you in the next 24 hours and whenever she says that they usually do um but what you've heard in the news versus the story they actually tell you are usually very different it's interesting isn't it how these things can change and this is exactly why i wanted to dig into it with you quite a bit and you're right you do need to listen to both sides of the story and you can probably find like most things have an element of the correct truth in there and then you have to kind of draw like the parallels between a few sources and then like you said go find the source material because when it gets recycled enough the narrative changes doesn't it it, it does and, and here's the other thing is that when when a publication takes a position on something, they don't like to admit that they were wrong. And so whatever the initial article is, that's the narrative for the rest of the case. And so it's one of the reasons why, you know, unlike a lot of attorneys, you know, so many attorneys, they love to say no comment. I never say no comment. Mm. Because from my perspective, if I can affect what that first article says that i'm going to affect what the narrative is throughout the entire case yeah even if i can pull it back to a neutral position of saying prosecution said this but the defense attorney said this even if i can pull them back to that neutral position that neutral stance is what is going to carry through to the end of the case so I, I actually, I'll give you a great example here. I represented the three guys who parachuted off of One World Trade Center a few years ago, and it was a it was a media circus case in New York City. And what happened in that case is the police were leaking to the media that they were going to arrest them, you know, later that week. And so I got a I got a reporter that called me saying, "Hey, the police are telling me that they're going to you know arrest this guy later this week." Um, would you like to comment? And I said, sure. And I told him the whole story. And ordinarily, think about every article you've ever read about an arrest. Every article you've ever read, 90% of it is the prosecution says this. 10% down at the bottom, defense attorney couldn't be reached for comment. Defense attorney wouldn't comment. Defense attorney gave a short comment. 90-10. The article came out the next day, 9010, but it was the district attorney's office didn't comment. And so we went into that trial where the net the media narrative had been set that these guys were folk heroes. 
and everybody loved what they did. And, you know, we put the video on YouTube, the helmet cam video. And so they were at such a disadvantage because when we got into that courtroom, everybody, the public, the media, the jury pool, they were all in favor of my guys. Nice. And, that's and how we you got a not guilty verdict. Cool. I mean, that's pretty cool that they would jump off that, though. <laughs> that must have been a fun oh, yeah. case to work with. They must have been a, a pretty crazy bunch of guys, right? <laughs> oh, they were great. They were great. It was it was one of the funniest cases I've ever tried. And uh, in front of the same judge who has the Trump um, you know, uh, case in Manhattan now. Um, but it was an incredibly funny case. Yeah, I had the witnesses laughing. I had the judge laughing at one point. The jury was laughing throughout. It was a great case. Have you... um? Okay, so the kind of last two parts of the podcast tend to be actionable stuff for people and everything. But kind of while we're on the subject now, have you got any funny stories, man? Have, have, you, got, have you got a like a, a crack-up story from one of these cases that you just think you know what, that was just, that required a different kind of approach that worked out in a hilarious way. Any any stories from your time there that's going to give our listeners a little bit of a, a chuckle before we go into actionable stuff? Sure. Well, okay. Good example is that base jumper case. So these guys, there was no question they did it. Okay. They broke in the building. They climbed to the top. They jumped off with parachutes. They totally did it. <laughs> um, they were guilty of misdemeanors, trespassing, of base jumping. But what the district attorney tried to do is they tried to charge him with burglary, which in, in New York state law, burglary is unlawfully entering or remaining in a structure with intent to commit a crime therein. It's, yeah, they unlawfully entered or remained. That's that's trespassing with intent to commit a crime. Base jumping is is also a crime. So they figured, hey, we'll take two misdemeanors wrap them up into a felony that has seven years in jail. Except intend to commit a crime therein. Therein means inside the building. Base jumping by its very nature is there out. It's outside the building. And so I turned this two-week trial, which really just turns on the question of is the roof inside or outside of the building? I turned it completely around on them and just tortured the government for it because you know they brought in all these detectives to show you know he, we have this you know multi-billion dollar ring of steel security system with security cameras everywhere and here's where they landed and here's where they ran and here's where they got in the car and then we have license plate readers and so we we read all the license plates and that's how we found them detective how many of those cameras are facing in well none you don't have any video of them getting in the building, do you? No. Well, wouldn't that be important to you to know how they got into the building? Well, yeah, it would. So number one terrorist target in the world, right? Yes. Well, what did you do to try and find out how they got in the building? Well, we couldn't really do it. So you spent all this time trying to find them after they left. Wouldn't a security system be more effective at keeping people out? <laughs> well, yeah. And... We set the theme with that, and the, the prosecution just kept getting stupider and stupider with it, and the jury kept getting more and more offended by it. And they put this guy on, this detective, who had recovered my client's logbook. And so he's reading from the logbook that the, the prosecutor wanted him to read from any entry that sounded dangerous. Um, By the way, they're all dangerous. It's a base jumper, but... And so he, I've, you know, a few. On this, I've had a few on the show. <laughs> They're crazy. <laughs> right. Uh, on this date, water landing, this date, tree landing, you know, this one, parachute landing fall. Uh, this one, post came out. And so I'm just going through each one of them with them. Like, what does that mean? What does tree landing mean? Well, I guess they landed in the trees. Was that what was intended? Well, I don't know. So is it a mishap? Well, I don't know. This one, parachute landing fall. Do you know what that means? No, I don't. Uh, I guess it means he fell. Well, isn't it a landing technique? I don't know. It is a landing technique. Uh, in fact, it's the first landing technique you learn in airborne school. Um, post came out. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. Well, what's a post? I don't know. Was it part of the skydiving rig? 
I don't know. Is it part of the building? I don't know. Over there. See in the front row? That reporter over there from the New York Post. Was it her? Did the New York Post send somebody out? And he starts laughing. He's like, Castle, I don't think that was it. That is what it is. <laughs> the New York Post did come out. And then, you know, so we, we went through all these things and I finally turned away. Wait a minute. Several of those entries in there, it says location Waldo, right? It says, yes. Detective, where is Waldo? The whole courtroom loses it at that point, including the judge. Prosecutor's bad at me, but that's okay. And the detective is sitting there laughing. He's like, I, I, I don't know. Can you please explain to the jury what investigative steps you took to find Waldo? I give up. I don't know. So he <laughs> leaves. Um, the truth is Waldo is a, a, a tall tower upstate New York that's painted red and, and white stripes. Um, I walk out of the courtroom because we take a lunch break. And the detective is standing outside the courtroom waiting for me which is usually a really bad thing, by the way. Um, I walk out, I see him, I'm like, uh-oh. Detective walks up to me, he says, God, so I've been a cop for 26 years. I've never laughed so hard in a courtroom as that. I need your card. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> That's unbelievable. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> did, 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 you yeah. ever, did you ever work from after that? No, no, he, he never called me. I mean, luckily. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's you got to take these cases and make it a look at it a little bit differently, yeah, you know, and make it entertaining. Yeah, because ultimately that's what it is. Trial, a trial is is theater. It's storytelling. You know, it, it's not theater like fictional storytelling. You have to tell the truth. You have to present a factual case. But if you can keep the jury engaged and keep them interested and build trust then they will vote you know they, they will consider all of your arguments and they'll vote more likely in your favor if you sit there like a stone the whole time and just read from your binder and lecture them they're not going to take you as seriously yeah yeah really really interesting thanks for uh thanks for sharing that that's that's great i mean you've, you've clearly uh you clearly got your job down to a t um as I mentioned, we kind of go into like a bit of a, an actionable stage of the podcast towards the end where we can actually, everyone can take a little something away from it. Obviously, we've had a good chuckle at the stories and we, uh, we've we probably got a good insight into now what you do and how it works. But read us our, read us our rights. So as someone listening in right now or me as the host, just everyone in general, you know, I'm no legal head at all. I doubt many people listening in probably are, but I think we have like a very, very bare bone, probably idea of like what our rights are as people. So what's like the basic handbook, would you say of like rights and bare bone legal personal protection stuff that everyone needs to know as like, okay, this is the chock block. This is what you need to know. You need to know this. You need to know this. You need to know this for that essentially going into the future where nowadays, as we've seen in your career, you know, with the Dallas Alexander case and everything and just censorship, freedom of speech, it's threatened. And the state of the world seems to just be changing like the wind. So if you could kind of give everyone like a little pocketbook of what everyone needs to know, what would you say are kind of like those top few things in terms of legal protection and stuff that people should should have an idea about? So, I mean, the big thing is, you know, it's all it's all in the Bill of Rights to the Constitution. If you, if you read those amendments, for the most part, that's going to tell you most of, of what you need to know. Um, you know, the First Amendment, you know, the Second Amendment, the Third Amendment, you don't really have to spend as much time on. Um, I, I like to tease other lawyers about, you know, do you think there are any Third Amendment implications here? And everybody's always staring at me because everybody tells only forgets what the third amendment is and it's it is you know about the quartering of troops <laughs> that we should <laughs> that you should not be forced to quarter troops in your house um but aside from that one you know fourth fifth sixth are the ones that i deal with you know the most 
Um, but to put it even more simply, uh, and, and you actually said it right in the beginning, you said, read us our rights. Um, it's exactly what the Miranda warnings say, but take it seriously. You have the right to remain silent. Shut up. Don't talk. Okay, there is nothing you can say that's going to help you. You're being read your Miranda rights because you are under custodial interrogation. Okay, you're not free to leave. And they want you to say something that's incriminating. They're not giving you an opportunity to talk your way out of it. There is nothing to be gained from speaking. You have you, anything you say can and will be used against you. That's true. You have the right to an attorney. Yes, exercise that. If you're really worried about, you know, and cops love to do the whole, you know, well, if you have nothing to hide, why would you, why wouldn't you talk to us? If you're really worried about that, which by the way, you know, that's a trick. If you're really worried about it, just say, look, I'd love to help you guys. But unfortunately, I've, I've read too many other stories and, and things. I'd feel more comfortable talking to you if I had an attorney. Now, if you really want, just say that. And then the attorney can come in and say, come on, guys, you're not talking to him. Get out of here. You know? And so, I mean, that, but that's the big thing is exercise your right to remain silent. Exercise your right to an attorney. And get the best attorney that you can. Attorneys are one of those things where the quality wi varies widely. Um, with certain exceptions, attorneys really are one of those things where you get what you pay for. Um, you know, if you're paying a very low rate for an attorney, you have to wonder why. Is it because that attorney, you know, is desperate for work? Is it because they run a volume practice where they charge a much more reasonable rate because they have, you know, so many cases um, you know, do they take, you know, you could take 10, 10 cases on at a time for one price, or you could take a hundred cases on for much less, but then you only spend a 10th of the time. Um, then I say, like, like I said, there are certain exceptions to that. Um, but that's, that's the basics of it. Okay. So, you know, I hope I don't ruffle any feathers with this question at all. It's just, I'm going to, put at least what I believe is a common belief out to you okay. and see what you make of it. And at least maybe, maybe it's not common. I don't know. This is my, this is my understanding of like the thing as someone who doesn't really know too much on the subject, but from what I've kind of heard, what I've seen, either kind of like in joking situations or whatever with friends and everything, it kind of sounds a little bit like when you come into law and courtrooms and lawyers and stuff, when you have someone who's very rich or powerful or corporations that are rich, powerful, they have legal teams, which are at least described as very strong. And mm -hmm. if you're someone like myself or something who can't have, or like doesn't have deep pockets to you know, fish out for very expensive lawyers, um, it doesn't sound like you're going to get very far with, with that. So you're going to get basically whitewashed out of uh you know, out of the out of the courtroom. So I guess what I kind of want to get a little bit of clarity on is for everyone listening is to some degree is like kind of going off what you just said there. Is it slightly pay? Is it slightly pay to play when you come into? Are, are there two systems of justice in this country? The answer is yes. Yeah, there are two systems of justice. Um, I I don't. <laughs> The two systems of justice are not purely based on you know, racial disparity. They are based on economic disparity, which, yes, does you know frequently favor you know certain races over the others. But it is purely economics. And you are entitled to as much justice as you can afford. That is the unfortunate reality. Um, however... Those biggest, most expensive lawyers, the ones that are charging over a thousand dollars an hour, are not necessarily the best. They're not. They're the most expensive, and they they will tell you that they're the best, but you know what they're really the best at is charging their clients. So, 
you do have the ability to fight back if you get the right lawyer. Um, and, you know, there are good lawyers out there uh, that can be had for, for a more reasonable rate. Um, but to go up against one of these monolithic, you know, AmLaw 100 firms, I love beating up those guys. They're fun. <laughs> um, just the same as, and, and they're, they're not even quite as much fun as taking down the federal government. You know, the biggest, you know, most expensive law firm in the country, the United States Department of Justice. Um, so it is not an automatic loss just because one side has more money than the other. But is it an advantage? Absolutely. I mean, look, when I used to go in the night arraignments in New York City, I walk in, sit in the back of the room and watch. And you have case after case after case where these poor, you know, people are brought out handcuffs, brought up to the uh, to the podium where a public defender turns and talks to them for 30 seconds. Public defender is sitting there with a wrinkled suit, black sneakers instead of, you know, regular dress shoes, crooked tie, turns to the judge and says he'd like to plead guilty. And you see the cycle of that all night long. And then they call my client. And that public defender steps to the side and I walk up, pinstripe suit, you know, cowboy boots, you know, pocket square, everything arranged. And you know what the judge does as soon as I walk into the courtroom? Sits up straight. He starts paying attention. Because here is you know, a case that's going to be a little bit different than the others. Yes, there are two systems of justice. And when I, you know, when, when somebody like me walks into the room, the judges and the prosecutors, you know, they, they take notice. So, yeah, that's true. Hmm. It's a complicated. It's a complicated world. And it's hard, it's hard to imagine how that's fair, but I suppose that it's just the world that we live in. And yeah, it's something that I was, I, I had confliction about asking this next question. I wasn't sure if it was necessarily an appropriate question to ask. So I kind of pondered on the idea, but I feel like we get interesting conversation from the difficult questions at times. So I will ask it and sure. feel free to brush this off if it's, um, you know, if it, if I'll it is at least brush it off in an interesting way. <laughs> yes, uh, I like the sound of that. Um, going off of what you said there, the reason why I'm asking this is really because it leads out of the subject we just spoke about quite well. But when you get to the top of the food chain in terms mm -hmm. of politics, industry, corporation, and these people who are very, very powerful, is anyone truly innocent at the top? of the food chain there is anyone actually clean and when you get to that stage where people are so powerful and everything and they've got these legal teams behind them backing them and stuff is it just a case of who's cleaned their shoes better of the mud who kind of comes out on top of it all or or are there exceptions when it comes to these kind of things where people are actually totally clean in your opinion I'm actually, that's a good question. And I'm going to turn it on its head slightly because when I say there are two systems of justice, I'm not talking about guilty people walking free, although that certainly does happen occasionally. I'm talking about innocent people going to jail. There are an incredible number of cases where people are overcharged they're improperly charged, the investigations are done poorly, and the reality is that if you do not have the wherewithal to present the defense, you run the substantial risk of going to jail. Do prosecutors and the police target certain people? Yes. You know who, who they like to target? 
citizens, people, defendants. They get promoted based on their conviction rate. So they want to win every single case. You know, the, the fiction of a prosecutors out there just to do the right thing looks great on TV, but it's not something you regularly see in a courthouse. And so, you know, they do do everything they can to win their case, even if the police have arrested the wrong person. And so it's not about, you know, that the people at the top have these fancy lawyers and so they can get away with everything. It's about the people at the bottom don't have the fancy lawyers and therefore can't counter what the government is doing and therefore run a much more substantial risk of going to jail for something they didn't do. Hey. Wow. <laughs> it's the stuff that you don't see, isn't it? And, you know, as someone yeah. who doesn't know much about law, this has been a really, really insightful podcast. And you know, I, pre I appreciate you coming on. This has been really, really good. And the last thing I kind of want to touch on with you here, because I know we've got a bit of extra time on our hands. So, you know, we're going long. But if I paint like a little picture for you or like a little story, and this one's going to be more personal to me, because it was something that I thought of listening to your your podcast with uh, with Sean and so if we go into that story and you give me a little bit of advice there but also interlace kind of a generic advice to self so structure it in that way seeing what happened with Eddie Gallagher kind of opened my eye a little bit sorry not Eddie Gallagher um um Dallas Alexander opened my eye a little bit with what happened there and it's kind of a little bit scary slightly because actually the guests that Sean's had on his show are very similar to the guests that I've had on as well. We've got a few names that kind of coincide there. And in fact, you know, his recent guest, Tim Kennedy, I've asked him to be on the show before as well. And if something happened, like what happened with Dallas Alexander to a show like mine, for example, if it starts to go really big and starts to, you know, grow to the, hundreds of thousands you know 500,000 a million subscribers and then you know you get hit with something someone some government some something comes after you for something you've put out for example for me what's the flow chart there for approaching something like that happening and I guess what everyone could take away from your answer here is if you need a lawyer how do you go about that and how do you approach something when someone or something has come after you so engage with a lawyer early. Okay, that's what Sean did. The moment that he got that letter from the, uh, um, and uh, you want me to give a quick synopsis of that case so that people know what yeah, we're talking about? Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be uh, good, yeah. So so Sean, Sean Ryan had a guest on his show, um, Dallas Alexander, who was a former um, special operations sniper from the Canadian um, military. And they were talking about the world record longest sniper kill in history. And they showed some video of it. Uh, and he posted this episode. And then shortly thereafter, he got a letter from the, um, I'm going to forget the name of the agency, but it's basically the Canadian version of the Special Operations Command saying, you've just published classified information, you know, take, take it down, you're risking, you know, we, we can come after you for all these things. And, um, and so terrifying letter, um, which by the way, that's what lawyers do. We write terrifying letters. They're called interorum letters, which is Latin for too terrifying. Mm -hmm. And it had its effect. Um, but what Sean did is he immediately reached out to, to Eddie Gallagher and said, Hey, can I get Tim's number? Um, and so I read the letter. Those kind of letters which are intended to terrify you don't terrify me because I know what's behind them. And I read that letter and I immediately started laughing because I thought the threats you're putting in here only apply to people with security clearances. Some of them only apply to Canadian citizens, not American. And, and then there was a funny part at the end that I'll come back to in a minute, but um, but basically, Canada, their laws are different from the United States laws. And so 
a lot of what they were arguing is because they don't have a First Amendment. We do. And then the part of the bottom that was funny was um, additionally, any photographs taken by military personnel are the intellectual property belonging to His Majesty the King. Um, which I found unreasonably funny that here I'm getting ready to argue the U.S. Constitution renders everything you just said improper, and we actually get to talk about His Majesty the King because we wrote that document specifically because we didn't like having His Majesty the King anymore. Uh, so the big thing is when you get something like that, engage a lawyer early. And and that will give you a sense of perspective because as soon as as soon as Sean sent me the letter and I had the opportunity to read it and then explain it to him in constitutional terms, his blood pressure went way down. You know? Excuse me. Yeah. yeah so that's, I remember that case, that's yeah. really the big thing. Mm. Okay. And I think just for a generalized idea, at least like something that's going to be more or less generic, how deep of a pocket are we talking? So let's say, you know, in five years time, talk for podcast gets hit by something from a former military guest who may have revealed a story or something. Uh, how much are we talking in terms of like, what do you need to budget for a lawyer or someone who can adequately defend you like we said without being whitewashed by the whole thing so it it really depends it really depends you know lawyers charge in several different ways some charge flat fees uh some charge by the hour um i personally hate hourly billing i think it's terrifying because it's it's a blank check um especially for those lawyers that like to charge over a thousand dollars an hour um which is totally unreasonable in my opinion but um it really depends and really you you want to make sure that you have a clear understanding at the inception of um what is going to be covered and you, know, you take a case and you break it into phases most cases can be resolved very quickly unless the lawyer doesn't want to um, and this is unfortunately another, you know, sub theme here, uh, that may be beyond the scope for the time we have today, but unfortunately my profession also has a lot of people out there that are not doing the right thing, that are needlessly extending cases and making them more difficult and more expensive because they get to pay, get paid for. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult question to answer yeah yeah, yeah. I, I will tell you just my my personal um you know philosophy on it and, and how i operate um you know i said earlier you get what you pay for with a lawyer with certain exceptions um some lawyers like like myself have embraced you know the the cloud-based law firm mentality where everything that you used to do in that big fancy law office with having your library with all the law books and everything that's all pre-internet everything that that big office has i have on my laptop and so i don't need to spend any money on rent anywhere and so i run a nationwide law firm with multiple lawyers and my rent is a mailbox in my gym okay a mailbox and, and a shared lounge space in the gym and so all my people work from home. I work from home. This is my basement. And I pass that savings on to my clients. So by 50%, over 50% of a law firm's revenue goes to the overhead of maintaining that big fancy office. So if you can find a good lawyer who doesn't have a big fancy office, you're going to get much more value for your money. Cool. You know, our, you. our rates, are, our rates are about 50% of what I would charge if I had to have an actual, you know, fancy office downtown. Nice. All right, man. So, 
that's there are ways to get what you need at the price you can afford mm. okay well i've got your number now so uh uh, hopefully i don't have to make a call in future but if i do i think i know who i'll uh who i'll be looking to talk to and um well for now that's the um that's the, that's the questions for today tim i think we've just run over just over an hour so we think we're uh we've got a great episode just in the can there and um it's time for the the shameless plug so take a minute promote anything that you've uh you've worked on or are working on you want people to take a look at just something you believe in so that could be social media website and um please feel free to accept an open invitation to for another episode in the near future. Cause I feel like we've, uh, we've got a lot more to dig into as well for, for another episode. Sure. I mean, so my, I'm on uh social media. Um, Instagram is kind of my main platform uh, T parlatory first initial last name. Uh, and I, I post on there, um, you know, little explainer videos on, you know, various legal issues that come up, uh, as well as weightlifting videos, just because that's, that's what I like to do, practice law and pick up heavy things. <laughs> um, and, you know, my, my firm, Parlatory Law Group, uh, it's, you know, the website, www.parlatorylawgroup.com, uh, or on, uh, on the social media platforms at Parlatory Law Group. Um, you know, we have a team of attorneys that, you know, like I said, everybody works remotely. And so what that does for me is allows me to provide legal services to people that wouldn't otherwise be able to afford them. And a lot of people that I hire do things that I don't know how to do. And so a lot of our focus is on helping entrepreneurs, you know, grow their businesses. And so, you know, particularly veteran entrepreneurs that want to start a business and you know, all of the legal aspects that you could go on legal zoom and try and figure out on your own, but probably mess up you can get those services at an affordable rate with us. Um, the other thing that allows me to do is because no, nobody has to be in any particular place, uh, it allows me to hire a lot of people that are otherwise you know, considered unhirable. Uh, about a third of my attorneys and 100% of my support staff are married to active duty military personnel. And so they move around constantly and they often don't live where their licenses are and so they're able to telecommute, you know, through that. Right. So, right. you know, so that's, that's my firm. Um, and, you know, beyond that, um, you know, that we, we do a lot of cases, we represent a lot of military personnel. Um, you know, a lot of what I'm doing, you know, now 2024, interestingly, has been the year of the Navy because I'm constantly in Navy courtrooms right now. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we, try cases and represent clients you know nationwide great stuff last little thing then that's become a new show classic kind of tradition is the very final final round off question if you found a young you kind of running around the streets 13 14 years old or something what would you want to whisper in young you's ear going forward into the future any key bits of advice or anything you've got there for a, for a young you no <laughs> i don't because everything that i've built has been through discovery and overcoming adversity and so there is nothing that I regret that I, that I'd say, Oh, I wish I could go back and tell younger me, um, you know, do this differently, do that differently because everything has been built upon learning through those adverse experiences. Great stuff, Tim. Thank you so much for joining me today for the talk for podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on man. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys for listening to this was episode 107. If you'd like to listen to the past episodes, go and have a look at the channel. And if you'd like to listen in for the future ones to make sure to hit that subscribe button and spread some love by leaving a like and a comment signing off for now fights on and see you next time. Good night. <laughs>